I don't, but thank you for asking. You know how actors have to pace themselves. You have to learn all their tricks to pace yourself for the season. Yeah. It's not easy. It's not a good argument for going full reckless. <laughs> That's right. You'll be a challenger. You won't do any interviews. You'll be, you'll be, uh, you'll, you'll create the mystery of the person with the Broadway show. Well, like that. You won't do any interviews. You know, you'll do like Does one. She not, yeah. She's done like one. She doesn't have to. Yeah, yeah. She can just go and say, I love you all. And everybody's happy. The, um, so I'm gonna start with yeah. an intro, but it's uh, it's just yeah, I can edit it if you need to stop cool. or anything, whatever. It's not like it's a live I'll, stream I'll, Facebook thing or anything like that. I'll, I'll tell you if manure just starts pouring out my mouth. <laughs> oh, well, all right. At least as long as it's out of your mouth, I mean, that's a little upsetting. That's your next show. Yeah, yeah. 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 It's Wait, did I just what did I say a series of incoherent sentence reference? As long as you sound confident, it won't matter. <laughs> no. I bet you, I bet you, I, 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 I know your shows are not about the topics that they address necessarily. Like, you're not interested in debating PEDS, and so you don't want to, but you made the mistake of taking a stance on PEDS. Unlike Christians, you made a mistake yeah. and you said, I don't understand what the fuss is. I mean, it's, it seems silly. Right, I'm like, right, no, right. what are you crazy? <laughs> so, you know, when I, it's well, like, that was, that, yeah, well, that was me being being perverse. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> well, no, but a lot of sports fans are like that. It drives me nuts. I'm like, I mean, it's so, yeah, it's so interesting. Well, you say it's interesting, but you're not saying it's interesting that they think something wrong. You're just saying it's interesting how some sportsmen just don't care. And I'm like, it's not fun. It's like when you're a little kid in a, in a backyard playing yeah. tag, there are rules. And if you don't follow the rules, they yeah. go, you're a jerk. Like, do you know, count to 10. You know, you get angry. I'm like, yeah. that's all it is. It's just everybody's got to play by the same rules. I understand some people are more gifted. They have a coach. They have yeah. life. But when you're on the field, it's the same rules for everyone as much as possible. And then your talent comes out and your hard work, and then you find out who's better that day. And they're like, well, I don't care, I don't care. I'm like, oh, really? You want to play poker? Do you like poker? Yeah. Go, let's play poker. I'll bring the cards. You know? Then they're like, oh, well, that's different because there's money involved. Yeah. We <laughs> don't really care about sports. Not, 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 a, not particularly, but I, I find the sort of um, the emotion that they generate that's that's the part that um, yeah and I was just always curious why why people get so invested in sports I mean you know you could say the same as anything that one sort of stuck with me again not that I'm saying it's it's wrong to be invested in it but not at all as a kid I never watched any sport at all I played tennis and I followed the tennis because of ball boy and all that my mom was a tennis umpire traveled the world so I was really into tennis, and but it's different. It's a single sport. I never, I didn't care about football or I never watched it. Like any of the World Series, you know, gay kids, South Florida, Palm Beach, Florida, and there was no baseball back then in South Florida. I came to New York in '91, and because of the movies, the Yankees are a baseball. You know, the Yankees. If there was a movie with about a baseball player, it was the Yankees. The Yankees are just oh, the Yankees. They're they're like a movie team, and so I wanted to go to a game. A friend took me. I was like, it's kind of fun. It's like it was like I call it urban fishing. You're there, you sit back, you chat, and every once in a while something happens. You know, yeah. so there's a nibble of a fish. Oh, they got a hit, and then you pay attention. Then you just, and it's like three hours of random. And then I started to go a little bit more, a little more. I started in '91, and I went more. And I mean '94, and the team got better and better every year, so it was easy for me because they were just fun young players, and it got better and better. And it mattered so much when they got to the post. I mean, I was like the amount of emo and the people you're with all season and like, yeah. I was like, oh my God, this is insane. I mean, they you know, get to the World Series, I mean, it's like the emotion and how much it meant to me. And like, and I had a life, other people, they have a crappy job, it's, it's what they do, they yeah. go to a yeah. game. And so I started to understand like how, you know, you feel invested, it's not just the time somehow, but it just really, you watch these players grow and you're with your friends. Yeah. And it's, it's a story. It, it is it, a story. It's, it's just a larger narrative. Yeah. I mean, it can work for any passion, but I really didn't understand caring that much about a team. And I was like, Come! you know, and yeah. crying and excited, you know. It really, it really works. <laughs> We're slowly dripping your coffee. I was going to wait until she came in. We can just start, actually. Yeah, yeah, you can yeah, get yeah. it in there. Sure. The, uh, <clears throat> I'm going to get one more sip of water. Welcome to Book Filter. I'm Michael Giltz. Today we're talking with a playwright whose last name rivals my own for difficulty in saying and spelling. It's Lucas Nath. Nath or Nath? Nath. 
All right, because Leonard on the radio said Nath, I think. Oh, did he? I, well, yeah. it sounded like Nath. I was like, all right, wait a second. I thought it was Nath. I thought I just had it down. He was on a roll. Please, of course. We got some... <laughs> no, no, you don't want to interrupt Leonard when he's on a roll. He's been a fan of your work for a while, mm -hmm. as have I. Um, Lucas has a new play. He's making his Broadway debut. It's A Doll's House Part Two, the rather puckishly titled play. Uh, it has more Tony nominations than any other Broadway show this play, not show, but play this year. Uh, eight Tony nominations, including, of course, Best Play. It's an exciting year because all four Best Play nominees are Broadway debuts by American playwrights, which may be one of the first times in history that this, that's, that's ever happened. So it's a pleasure to talk with you. Thanks for being with me today. Thanks for having me. Uh, the new show, uh, like I said, I've, I've been seeing all your shows in New York. I think I've seen them all. I started, somehow I was lucky enough to go see Isaac Zion, a small, small space. I was like, wow, this is exciting. Please have your coffee anytime. Oh, yes. You don't have to wait, my God. Uh, you're tired. It's the middle of Tony season, I understand. And I saw Isaac Zion. I really liked it, so of course I wanted to pay attention. Then I saw your next piece. Uh, which is the Disney play. This is the order I've seen. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and that play was slightly more well-known people, and it's still a small space. Yeah. Then I saw Red Speedo, then I saw The Christians, and then they announced you were coming to Broadway, and I was like, oh God, I got a little scared for you. I was like, oh, is it too soon? What are they doing? Because we're not used to playwrights being on Broadway in a weird right. way. Yeah, especially, you know, this is a play that uh, the first time I ever even saw it with an audience was in the John Golden Theater. So it, it was, was here, not in California. It, it actually technically premiered in California. They were, the productions were happening basically at the same time, but I had to end up being here for rehearsals. So the first time I ever saw the play with an audience was in New York. Oh, interesting. So if that's not strange enough and unusual, it's exciting to make the leap to Broadway. It happened in a very natural way. Smaller, a little bigger, a little bigger, a little bigger, and then that leap. Uh, but to have two productions practically at the same moment. I mean, it was commissioned in California, yeah. so the world premiere was there at the same time as it was happening on Broadway. That seems pretty unusual and unprecedented to me as well. Yeah, yeah, it was, and, and uh, uh, kind of uh, happened with relatively little difficulty. <laughs> it wasn't a lot of red-eye travel, you were okay? No, it wasn't. It, we, we, we put a pretty good system in place for coordinating with the team there, and and letting them do what they needed to do and be on their own track and, and uh, continuing to develop the play here. But you were adding stuff in and actors yeah. were making suggestions. You like to collaborate, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Were, you, were people in California like, you're like, I got a new life for you? Yeah, th that did happen. And, and they were incredibly um, uh, uh, open to everything that was happening here. You know, anytime a change would go out, um, it would always go out to them with some context which actually only helped them kind of understand deeper how the play was working, why I was making changes I was making. Um, it kind of brought them still into the thinking behind the process. And, and that also became a really good exercise for me, just practicing giving context to different groups of people for why the changes were happening. It helped me understand better why I even had the impulse to make those changes. But it's, uh... Is it like, wow, I always want to have two productions mounted at the same time. Let me see, because the LA production, yeah. the California production, is uh, a, a little more serious from the reviews I've heard. It seems to hit a slightly more serious tone yeah. than the New York piece. And that's, I mean, that happens with plays, but not usually when they're just making their debut. Usually there's sort of a certain vision that's coming together. And so that's kind of cool to see it be done in two slightly different ways. Yeah, yeah, it is. It, well, it became a way of sort of testing how certain parts of the play work and, and um, you know, even even a, the production being in a different space and and a different relationship to the proscenium changes uh, how presentational you can go with the play, and then that changes how certain lines work. And so it was a it was a crash course in just understanding the underlying DNA of the play. I don't think most people realize, uh, even most ardent theater goers, how much of a difference it makes what space you're in, what house. I mean, you're yeah. in Broadway, but like, are you in this Broadway house? Or are you in that Broadway house? Yeah. It really makes a big difference. There was something that, that in, in Scott Rudin was kind of, is incredibly interested in that type of stuff. And when we first met um, to even talk about this play coming to Broadway, I said, my biggest concern is this play getting lost behind a Broadway proscenium. Right. So then that there, there came this mandate to break the proscenium somehow. 
Did the stage just shuts out? Yeah, yeah. The uh, we, 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 we killed a number of seats in the front. And Thank we, you. Yeah. We built the <laughs> stage. I'm sure they're thrilled. Like, oh, yeah, let's just take out 50 seats. But, What's that? But, it, but it, 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 you know, the moment we got to the space and saw the set and started working, it, it was apparent that, that, yes, that was the right choice to make and it was worth losing those seats because it, it turned the play into, I talk about the play a lot, it's been kind of like a boxing match a little bit, or I talk, I actually tend to use that analogy with a lot of my plays, and, and this one, it really does feel like you have ringside seats if you're sitting up, uh, up against the stage. Yeah, Evo beat you to that in terms of actual <laughs> staging with the, his Arthur Miller, but there you go. Uh, is it, you're in the middle of a Tony season, you're tired, uh, and I appreciate you taking the time to talk. <laughs> the coffee's helping. The coffee's helping a little bit. It's it's really stressful though, isn't it? I mean... Uh, it's fascinatingly stressful. I'm trying to figure out like why it's so stressful. It shouldn't be. But there is this sort of, um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm very interested in sort of uh, the whole subject of even interviews about plays and like, what does it do to your relationship to the play? What is it, you know, and, and, and as you kind of go into this meta mode and start reflecting on the play, you have these sort of new realizations, then you have new ideas about the play, and, and you, you, you almost want to kind of like go back in and do even more rewrites in the course of, of the interview process. But um, yeah, it's, 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 it, it's, uh, it's so funny to be able to, I'm trying to you know, have other plays to be working on, and it's, it's the same part of the brain does the writing is also the same part of the brain that I kind of use when I when I talk to people about a play, mm -hmm. and so I sort of I'm coming to terms with. You're well, draining this is, this that. Is, well, it's just also like I, I I'm trying to figure out like how to how to use the interviews to fuel future writing. Mm -hmm. So I do a lot of after I talk to people about the play, I go off and like I write my notebooks about other plays and see if there's ideas that came out of the conversation that I just had with you and use those in a new play. Now yeah, you put a lot of pressure on me. I know. <laughs> if your next play isn't I'm like good. Going, I'm so. going so meta now this morning. <laughs> I'm like, but there's just a, a, a financial pressure. I mean, at every stage, it feels like when it's off off Broadway, and even off Broadway, they're building a pool, they're doing things. But still, it feels like it's about the play, it's about the work, it's about the play, no matter what. The, but suddenly, now it's like big money, and yeah. I don't know how. And it's hard. It's like when you make a movie, leap to a movie. Does that, is that are you able to just say no, no, no? It's about the work. I've been, you know what? Are you in studying this the particular, <laughs> No, not at all. And I've been kept. Um, uh, the, the whole team has sort of um, kept that out of the way. I mean, again, it's, it's the, the, when, when Rudin came to me and asked me uh, what I would need to bring this to Broadway, I basically asked for everything I would have in the course of getting a play ready for the Humana Festival. Mm -hmm. And we kind of built a process that resembles exactly what I would do getting ready to premiere something at the Humana Festival. And as a result, it actually made the whole process one where I'm actually not even thinking about how expensive stuff is. Or the marketing or... Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, so I, I feel really fortunate to have been sort of spared a lot of that, that worry. Um, yeah. It's, and doing interviews, you're able to think, you're able to make that leap. No, I'm not talking about me and trying to win an award. I'm talking about the show and hoping to get people to see it. Oh yeah, the other thing even occurred to me. <laughs> Actually, now that I know that. It's a stressful night though, it really is. It's really a, it's, it's, yeah. you're like, no, I don't care, I don't care. Like, it's still hard because, you know, yeah. there it is. I mean, it helps that the other three playwrights and I are all great friends. I mean, we just went out and all had dinner the other night. Oh, that's and, cool. And we're planning another. Uh, you mean a real dinner, together. just you, not yeah, like just you know, us, not some yeah. event? Just oh, us. We just sort of like, it was, it was um, just a really nice time to spend time with each other and say, how are we all doing? How are you doing? <laughs> Were you able to see their plays? Because I, I know you haven't, you joked in some earlier interviews, I want comps because I'm a cheap person. Well, <laughs> Broadway shows are expensive. <laughs> well, and I've actually gotten out to see very little. I, I've, yeah. I've, I've, I've gotten to see Indecent and I've read Sweat and I haven't gotten to see Ari Oslo, but mm -hmm. I'm hoping to correct that in the next two weeks. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and finally see Sweat and Oslo. That'll be cool. I would. I might have waited till after the season. Then I said, I haven't seen them. I haven't seen them. I love them. I love them all. You know, it might be easier, but uh, every choice is different. So yeah. So you're not feeling. Uh, you're, you're feeling only the pressure of the work. To clarify, the Humana is a great 
festival for plays. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm not sure what would be different putting a play on there other than short time and not a lot of you know resources. What's different about doing a piece at Humana than doing it off Broadway or on Broadway? Well, I mean, they so whenever I've done a play in the Humana Festival, I, I've been given roughly two workshop opportunities in advance of the production. Sometimes one, but often works out to have two, uh, where I get to start working with the cast and trying out new pieces. I'll, I'll have a draft, but I like to um, build, take every single beat in the, I actually literally do this, I will label every beat in the play, I give each one a title, and then I come up with every possible alternate beat or action <laughs> or way to play that beat. And, and I call these scraps, and I, I bring in, and sometimes it's as many as 100 pages of just scraps of additional material, alternate takes on moments in the play, and then I just ask the actors to read through it. And I may ask them to read through it a couple of times, and I just like to listen. And this is after we've read through the full script. Um, and uh, I like to listen, I'll, I'll, I'll ask the actors questions about the pieces, and get them talking about them, and and I'll be sitting there writing the whole time. And then I just go home and I start stitching in some of those pieces or I'll, I'll it'll give me new ideas for other uh, uh, scraps. And, and uh, it, it, it gives me time to sort of really think about, wait, why did I make every single choice I made in this play? And, uh, and it's great to have two opportunities to do that even before you get into rehearsal. And then uh, this was a rehearsal process where I was given the freedom to just continue bringing in new pieces and, and because the actors had been working with us since the first of those two workshops we started in October, they also kind of had this uh, uh, almost x-ray view of the play where they saw all of my thinking about every possible moment. So as we're continuing to work up into previews, we're still talking about Wait, do you remember that one piece that you brought in? I don't remember when it was, and Laurie would like say a line from it. I'm like, oh yeah, that was interesting. Wait, why didn't we do that? And then I'll reconsider, and maybe I'll put in something that I left on the floor a long time ago. So it, it's, it's, and so uh, that's what I do when I sort of will premiere something out at the Humana Festival. Um, and uh, we just sort of imported that process here, and, and it worked well. I was happy with it. The, um, that was another switch, uh, suddenly you're dealing with actors who you've seen on TV or film, or certainly on Broadway stage, or they've won Tony Awards, that's yeah. very exciting too. You quickly get beyond the idea that they're celebrities or stars that people recognize on the streets. Once you start to work with them, they just become actors, of course. Yeah, and, and just the, the, the work ethic in general, like we all, we're all just getting into it and getting messy, and, mm -hmm. and, and everybody's going off and reading stacks of, you know, the, we, had, we always had books, um, stacks of books of research, historical context, all that stuff that any of the actors at any point could just pull and start reading. And so actors would take stuff from our little library and take it home and read it and we'd talk about it the next day. Yeah, everybody was like fully invested and, and just doing the work, which was great. No, no, no diva acts. <laughs> well, no, no, of course not, but it didn't take you a few days to go, oh, I'm dealing with Tom Cruise, you know, you're dealing yeah. with an Emmy-winning star. Well, but, but in part it was because there was no, it, it, because everybody just leapt straight into work. I, mm -hmm. I, I forgot that, you know, they, they're, they're these stars they've been watching on the screen for ages now. Or, or Jane Howdy Show, who I saw, first time I ever saw her was in the very first public reading of Well. Oh. And uh, I was a big Lisa Crone fan from Five Lesbian Brothers days, and, mm -hmm. and then I was so thrilled that Lisa, Lisa Crone was like, "Who is that? Yeah. Who is that? I have to do a play with her too." <laughs> Uh, the um, you, you've often said that you write plays to fill in gaps. What's missing? What's not being talked about? Or what kind of pieces uh, can I tackle? So in this case, you felt yeah. like there weren't enough sequels to plays by Ibsen, or <laughs> I know. Well, that's that's part of it. Like, yeah, uh, uh, I I'm really interested in missing information and and uh, well, gaps in, in in conversation, but also missing information and what we don't know is what happened to Nora. So uh, I was. I was drawn to that part of it, and um, uh, and the title. You've never been shy of a of a of a good title to lure people in, right? Yeah, From the start, you have yeah. fun. I mean, at Doll's House Part Two, that's where it started for you. Yeah, it did. It did. And then and then uh, the the real work of building the play began when I I 
found a really bad translation of Ibsen's play online, cut and pasted into a Word document, and just started writing the whole thing in my own words. And I, I kind of stripped out a lot of things that, that feel very familiar about a doll's house. So I stripped out, say, like macaroons and said, yeah. And I also stripped away some of the, the, the language we associate with Torvald, the sort of, oh, my little lark, my little bird, squirrel, all that stuff. Squirrel, yeah. Because it became, I, I thought it was, he, in, in most translations, I mean, he's just so obviously so condescending and, and, and um, you know, seems to belittle her that I was curious what happens if you pull back on that a little bit. Um, are there more interesting ways in which he's belittling her that are less obvious? It's so easy to sort of watch Torvald and, and hear him call her a squirrel and, and, and just say, oh, that jerk. And I wanted to make it a little harder and, and see if there was something deeper underneath it. And, and it's, it's two things that became apparent. Um, the, and this sort of gets back to your question about like what's missing from a conversation. Um, it seems that the Nora and Torvald are both pretty bad communicators in the original play. They're, they're, they're tiptoeing around each other all the time. They're, they're, they're not wanting to upset the other too much and they don't want any conflict. Until the end, you know, when yeah. stuff blows up, and 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 Nora gets a chance to sort of start to be honest, and then she walks out, and that feels like a conversation that wants to keep going. Um, but of course, the, the the other problem that sort of exists between them is they're that they're living in these roles where, you know, there there is an Im, an implicit understanding that. Torvald owns Nora, mm -hmm. you know, and there's explicit is legal. Yeah, well, in the, yeah, but she, she, in in how they interact with each other, there's a kind of um, presumption of ownership, and and again, that's another case where it's very easy to look at that and say, now we're, we're past that. And <laughs> that's what's fascinating about the play, the idea that you can, wow, we're still wrestling with all these issues. There's very little that feels dated in terms of ownership and personal rights and control over your body and your yeah. freedom and your, so that's what's kind of upsetting and fascinating and fun about the show to realize 120 years or whatever later yeah we're still there yeah yeah I, I guess yeah no to, to I think I think you're right to sort of flag that that, that, that implicit explicit uh, uh, distinction because yes it, it, in, in the original it, it, you're right it, it's more explicit and I'm kind of interested in what are the ways that are a little harder to see and can I make those more visible? Well, and that's one of the things that for me runs through your plays when, I, when I've seen him is just the struggle with ethics and choices and morality from Isaac's Eye where you're uh, doing what you can to get into a science academy and you maybe are stealing your, uh, another person's work to of course the, the Christians where you have an evolving faith as a preacher and you want to tell your parishioners but you're not sure what the right time is. Maybe you wait till after the fundraiser has yeah. happened. Uh, obviously, Red Speedo with uh, performance enhancing drugs. Uh, Disney, in which you're wrestling with presenting a public image of a wholesome, happy all American yeah. with the reality of business and family. And then here, where you're tackling uh, marriage and divorce and the, the ethics of I had to leave, but what does that do to other people? And that's what's so fun about the play the idea that. She comes back and a lesser playwright might have just said, all right, we're gonna beat up on Nora. Hey, you left. You know you left the kids, right? I mean, because that's kind of the most shocking thing, yeah. even today and back then, it must have just been un unbelievable. I mean, she doesn't reject this marriage, she rejects marriage and she leaves, but it affects them. And everybody has their turn with her in this boxing match. You have the servant, you have the daughter that she abandoned and the husband who's sort of still bewildered or he wants to be bewildered. And they all have really good points to make. And she's like, that's a great point. But you know, no, I'm still right. I had to leave. And it's just, it's awesome. So it's really fun to see them wrestling with that. Yeah, I have this book on my shelf. I, 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 I think I think the law school was throwing out books and I pilfered the bin of books that mm -hmm. they were throwing out. And there's this one book called, What Do We Owe Each Other? And I've never actually read the book, but it sits on my shelf and <laughs> stares back at me. And I think it's actually been one of the single that book has influenced me more than any other book, just simply because the what title. Do we owe each other? <laughs> and, and I feel like that's the running theme in in uh, every play I've written since I picked that book out of the bin so many years ago. Um, I'm I'm 
there's this question I have of like, how much should, it, it, it's, there, there's this point where self-care hurts somebody else mm -hmm. and, and how do you negotiate those situations? Um, I guess there could be the argument that everything we do has a kind of ripple effect that somehow it's hurting somebody. But uh, I'm interested in those cases where where you're forced to confront the fact that I have to do what's right for me, but it's also having this effect on you. But uh, I, I mean, it's not an answerable question. Like it's it's just one that spins you back and forth. And so I think that's why I keep writing about it. But that's what's, I mean, she said, no, okay. Uh, but you know, Torvald chose to do what he did. She's like, she had to do what she did, but if she's doing what's right for her in an appropriate way, it shouldn't have a negative effect on others. It may have an effect, but only if they refuse to allow themselves to change or grow based on what she did. I mean, that's that's the daughter and that's the maid, and that they made choices. He's like, well, I didn't tell you to do that. <laughs> you know? But it's, a, it's such a fun thing because they all surprise us, and yet they're all very consistent with who they are in this play. Yeah. Uh, not necessarily who they were in the original play. And that's sort of, you've talked about writing plays with the director in mind. And in this case, it feels like your collaborator was Ibsen. Yeah, no, that's actually really interesting. It's true. I, when, I, when I started writing this, it, it, it wasn't so much written with a director in mind. I, I just kind of leapt into it. And, and I think that's funny. I hadn't really thought about it, but I think you're right. That, that might be one of the reasons why, because I was... Um, I, I found this great book called Ibsen, the Dramaturgy of Fear. <laughs> and it's... Oh, gosh, I wish I could remember the name of the author. That's bad of me. But um, the, uh, the opening line of the book is something like, uh, in the place of Ibsen, all characters are killers. And uh, reading that book became a, a great way of sort of dialoguing with Ibsen's tropes and his um, you know, you know, talk about like in every Ibsen play there is a collapse. A character has a moment of like physical collapse or <laughs> surrender. And, and uh, uh, so I'm like tracking all of these little tropes and figuring out what do I do with them? Is this part of the play? So that actually, you're right, probably replaced to some degree me thinking about a director in a particular director's voice or, or um, toolkit. Uh, I was born in South Florida. I go, oh no, what am I saying? I was born in Bermuda. But I grew up in South Florida in Pompano for a lot of Oh, okay, as, yeah. a, as a kid, and you grew up in the Orlando area. Yeah, yeah. Was I was born in Miami Beach and grew up in Orlando. Um, Someone said Longwood or some other neighborhood. Well, I, I, you're right. I, I, at one point, I, I moved to Longwood uh, from about maybe age two to nine or eight. I was living uh, not far from Disney World mm -hmm. um, in some back roads near an orange grove and a gun range mm -hmm. and that's uh, florida very rural welcome florida. to florida <laughs> <laughs> and then and then the family uh, moved to longwood florida which is uh, a bit less rural and i guess they exist out west or whatever but geodesic domes you see them in florida sometimes you drive you grew up in a geodesic dome yeah. i've been in them in a planetarium or something i guess but i've never been in a home like one and i always thought there's nowhere to hide. I always felt like there were no rooms and you couldn't, there's no corner for you to, you know, everywhere you, know, you went, people could see you. Lynn Nottage said to me, and mm -hmm. I've been wrestling with this ever since, she said it to me last week. She said, we were talking about childhood homes, and she says, uh, she has a theory, I'm gonna butcher, butcher her theory a little bit, but um, she believes that your childhood home is secretly the dramaturgy of your plays. <laughs> your your play structures, the er structure of your plays, has some relationship to your childhood home. And, <laughs> and, and, and what does that mean? You, well, you actually might have solved it for me because I was wondering, wait, what does it mean to have grown up in a geodesic home? And you're right that it is it is a circle that all the walls are curved. There's no corner to back into, literally. Right. And and. Um, uh, it, it is there is it is an intensely theatrical space um, because there are uh, rooms built up into the center of it and it feels like a, an arena of some kind. Wow! Um, yeah. So it, it's that may say a lot about why I'm drawn to plays that are public forums. 
Yeah, there's, you have a lot of fun with presentation in your plays, yeah. the mics and the Christians and this play. Uh, in fact, there's a very significant corner in this play and everybody retreats to it all the time. <laughs> yeah. You know, Nora's back there touching the wall, feeling like, what's going on here? You know, everybody like likes to go back there. That's why I say you can go in the front row. If you, if you want to rush a ticket, the front row is okay. Don't worry, you won't be, you'll be close. There'll be like six rows away yeah. in terms of space. Yeah, I mean, and, 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 and I just recently watched it from the mezzanine and again, you just, like even from up there, you're acutely aware of how this play is a chess game. Uh, but yeah, kind of like Copenhagen. Did you ever see that? Yeah, I did. I did, yeah, I did actually. A, and, and, and that I do think kind of stuck in the back of my brain too. Mm -hmm. um, that was a that was a I think an influential experience. So you uh, you, you grew up in uh, Orlando, and that's where you were had learned the joy of promotion and not being afraid of uh, you know the fun and the artifice and the, and the selling of that of stuff. And you also yeah. uh, you you did act in school plays. I did. I did. I did. Um, Shop of Horrors and were you, were you? I was Seymour <laughs> <laughs> and I was Scarecrow in Wizard of Oz. Like. Well, that's what you get for being gangly. All the gangly, yeah. all the gangly parts. I was a munchkin. No, I wasn't. <laughs> but I would have been. I was actually a narrator in the Wizard of Oz. Oh, you? Oh. I kept saying Dorothy. I was like second grade. I said Dorothy and her friends have gone. Oh, that's hilarious. <laughs> Um, yeah, no, I, I mean, I... And you did magic, and you're, did. Uh, you were involved in the church, because uh, your mom became an ordained minister, yeah. so you did magic in some, working with kids, so theater, theater was, stuff was always there. I was, yeah, I was always interested in, in stuff that was incredibly presentational, magic being particularly presentational, sermons being particularly presentational, um, direct address to the audience. Uh, I didn't want to be a priest, but I did want to be a priest so I could give the sermon and tell them what to think. That always, I was like, I knew if I was going to yeah. be a priest, it was just so I could do that. My mom was ready to encourage me to believe me. <laughs> the last of six kids, she would have been thrilled. Well, and, and similarly, I'm fascinated by lecturers, mm -hmm. uh, 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 the, 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 the lecture hall, image of the lecture hall. As opposed to a TED Talk. As opposed to a TED Talk, which actually I've been, I've been thinking about that quite a bit recently. Why? What is it about the TED Talk that, that, that interests me less theatrically? And, you know, it's everything from the... Because it's so aware of its theatricality, or... I don't know. It, it's, well, and it's also, it, 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 it's a little too polished. Yeah. You know, it's the, it's, the, it's the reason why I always want the Christians to be done with handheld mics. It's when it's that little, you know, Madonna mic or whatever they use. No, it has to be in it, yeah. It, a... it, there's something about it that's just slightly too slick. And I, I, I like the, the effort that it takes to hold the mic and what does it mean when you move the mic away and tilt it or um, it's action. So I'm sure you were a good writer in school. English class was easy, that sort of stuff. That was, and, but, it was actually hard for me. Oh, right, because you were more science. Yeah, based. yeah. Um, it took me a I was very uncomfortable with words. I, I, I still, to this day, I get nervous about grammar. Um, I get nervous about numbers. I hate, <laughs> I hate numbers because you can't, they don't, you can't fudge it. You know, in English, you can, even like if you're it. wrong with the answer, you can, you can do a good spiel like, ah, that was, no, give them a B. But numbers, you're either right or wrong. Well, but that's interesting. So, yeah, and, and I always struggled a lot with multiple choice tests because I could always figure out how every answer could, Adam. depending on the circumstances, <laughs> You were thinking be right. too much. <laughs> and, but it sort of informs how I write plays, too, mm -hmm. where, where I can't bring any point of view into the room without thinking, well... But what would be the argument for that? Um, you know, uh, the, the, and, and particularly kind of taking the sort of perverse point of view or, you know, the, this thing that, that I think Wally Shawn does it so well, where mm -hmm. he'll, have, he'll have a character just sneak in a preposterous, <laughs> offensive idea yeah. and just, you know, argue it in the most reasoned possible way. And, and, uh, Suddenly it's eugenics. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and it's, it's terrifying, but it's, it, I think it's, um, it's good work for the brain because you want to get training at spotting when people are sneaking in dangerous ideas or like uh, deeply flawed ideas. So when did you write like a, a beyond a class assignment, like a story or a poem or something creative in that way, other than like your formula where you're going to solve it? Yeah. You know, Fermat's theorem or something. Well, I think in high school I was drawn to plays very much in in uh, in the the idea of writing a play to me was always about the idea of designing a set. Like I wanted to create you know, diorama boxes and so I was drawn to people like Sam Shepard or 
actually Elmer Rice's adding machine very early on was a play that I was in New York, it was great. Uh, with with the, the opera or the... I the, saw the opera. Yeah, didn't I? which is actually also really a fantastic adaptation. But, um, uh, and I, 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 I had found a, an old copy of Adding Machine in the school library that, that also had a scene that isn't included in any versions that are done now, too. So that was... That was it kind of, an addendum or was it part of the play? It was part of the play at the time and then it was eventually cut. And, um, because I don't know, I don't know, but I've since like tried to find copies of the play that have a scene and they don't have it. <laughs> and it's, uh, but um, uh, but yeah, I like these sort of really highly theatrical environments, and so I would write plays. But really, it was an excuse to create theatrical spaces. Like you were a freshman, you were a sophomore. When did you well, write? This when was, did you write a was, scene or a play? This was probably high school, roughly maybe junior year of high school. Mm -hmm. I started dabbling. Then I went to NYU with the idea in mind that I was gonna go into pre-med. Right, I felt like uh, some some pieces suggested that your your mom was like, maybe you'd be a minister. And I felt like you said, well, I want to pre like, I, I don't want to save souls, but maybe I'll save their body. Was that like an, you didn't want to say, was there a sense of saying, I don't, I can't say I want to be a playwright, so I'll say I want to be a doctor because that's a little easy, it's a step away. Yeah, but it's I think that's true. And my mother wanted me to go into rock and roll. She like, oh, she you, did. Yeah, she wanted me to be a, a like rock Christian and roll star. rock. Like no, a, no, no, no. She, <laughs> she, she wanted was, you to be jars she, of clay or something. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, she, uh, she, she actually came out of the music business. She, you know, well, right. You're, you're, born, she's she was, North Dame minister, but a hippie. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. And, or half uh, a hippie, or two thirds a hippie. So that's that's what she always sort of imagined for me. Actually, um, they're in a geodesic dome. They're just hippies. <laughs> so, so, so what, rock and roll. Did you sing or play an instrument? I, I played piano, um, and I was actually not bad at it. And uh, I also played guitar a little bit. And yeah, I had a voice. I, I wrote I wrote songs. Uh, it, a couple of my early plays have songs in them. I haven't I haven't gone back to that in a really long time. Uh, I keep thinking I might. Mm -hmm. um, but um, yeah, no. I, I it was in college that I was sort of on this pre med track, and then I had a uh, there's a mandatory class you had to take writing the essay. And I was terrified of this class, and I had this teacher, this woman named Megan Abbott. Right, who's, a, who's a best-selling thriller. Writer. Yeah, <laughs> and she, uh, she, she encouraged me. She, she, she let me even teach a class on uh, Laura Mulvey's essay about the the masculine and feminine gaze in relation to David Lynch's Twin Peaks, <laughs> um, which is a very timely topic. I know. Um, David Lynch has some women issues. He's a lovely man, but he's working it out in his work. That's yeah, for sure. there's something. We, we, even as a freshman in college, I was really fascinated by that. It's like, what's going on there? It's like there's a mutilated female body. That's neat. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It it was so. So I started reading. You know, in in, in Megan's class, she taught us a lot. She taught us uh, Elaine Sixou and Marjorie Garber and Susan Judith Butler and and uh, Lacan and and. Um, Laura Mulvey, and so I was reading all of these um, gender studies texts, and, and uh, uh, it's just I found it really fun. And she she sort of encouraged me to to write um, not only academically but also creatively. And so I applied to transfer into the uh, Department of Dramatic Writing. Mm -hmm. That's a big change, but it's apparently not too much of a shock to your to your mom if you're like she's like rock and roll, and you're like yeah. okay, and you're writing songs as a kid, and you're writing scenes and plays yeah. and probably fiction and bad poetry, and you know then you go to college, and so it was not a uh, abrupt. I want to be a doctor. No, I want to be a playwright. Yeah. It was yeah, everybody, everybody supported it. They they were, they weren't quite sure what was going to become of me, but the, how you were going to eat. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You know, I, they, they knew that I that I always worked really hard at everything, and and uh, you know, I found ways to survive. And did you uh, did you have anything mounted in high school? Did any kids perform a scene of yours? Or? I I wrote a play pretentiously called The Zeitgeber. Um, the Zeitgeber. Yeah, which is a German. It's like the difference concept. of Zeitgeist. What is Zeitgeber? Zeitgeber is that which begins a cycle, and uh, or or or. Um, and Gunga Damarung yeah. ends it, or maybe yeah, Zeitgeber, okay. Yeah, and, and so I wrote this play, and I, I, 
I directed and starred in it. <laughs> it was, you were Orson Welles. <laughs> it, was, it was not a good but play. But thinner. Yeah. <laughs> well, no, it was, but it got it. You did it. Was it? Was it? Obviously, it was very serious. I assume. Yeah. Well, gamer. no, it was. It was. It was supposed to be funny. Uh -huh. um, I'm not sure that it actually was. <laughs> it sort of more or less kind of repeated the same scene over and over, and it was. Oh, okay. Uh, it, it was like variations. Yeah, yeah. and it was sort of. Um, uh, I hadn't yet read Beckett, but it was very Beckett before I read Beckett. I mean, I had been reading a lot of Sam Shepard and Albee, so. Mm -hmm. So it was more that than David Ives. Yes, yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. So that was uh, that was exciting. You, if you yeah, went on stage. It wasn't like you thought. Oh no! I mean, this is again. If all right, now you're in high school. You're staging, starring, and directing a play. This is not uh, the idea that you would suddenly switch to a theater. It doesn't yeah, seem quite yeah, so shocking. Yeah, no. It was. It was all seemed almost predestined. Was it ever like? Yeah, that's what I want to do. Or, or was it just, I'm going to try this? And, or when did you say, oh, I'm, I'm sunk, this is it? I actually think it might have been the, the, the former, that it was just sort of like, oh yeah, this makes sense. Mm -hmm. it, it was, the, it was the, the writing plays was the thing that in that freshman year of college, the thing that I was kind of doing in my own time, just dabbling, and I, I, kept, I kept coming back to it. And I was also, in, at that time, getting introduced to um, Carol Churchill's plays and, and Richard, Richard Foreman. Foreman. Yeah. One of the first things I saw in New York was the ontological theater. Which and, one? Uh, I don't even remember now. It was it was dizzyingly odd and yeah. it was exciting. There was string everywhere. You know, it was very cool. Yeah, that, I mean, that so much reminded me of, of you know some odd way Disney. You know, it sort of tapped into that thing that it, it that Richard Foreman's plays got me excited about theatrical space in a way that that the theme park rides got me. I, I actually always describe going to Foreman's Theater as like a trip to the fun house. Right. And, um, yeah, so they, they, and that sort of formed a big part of what I consider to be theatrical. And, and uh, uh, I mean, my own place looks so different from that. But uh, his, it, Foreman's work was great training in just understanding how does the stage work? Because he was just such a master at sort of sustaining Atten uh, sustaining interest and attention with the slimmest of yeah. of, of, of storyline. Yeah. yeah, you know the dramaturgy of a sound loop in Richard Foreman's plays is just utter genius. Like he knows exactly how to fade up a sound loop to kind of catch your interest as you're starting to drift away. Uh, dramaturgy is a word that a lot of people don't know well or yeah. understand the role of it. Uh, explain what a dramaturg is. Uh, a dramaturg is a is a in their, their role on productions can vary. So if you dramatically, uh, yeah. <laughs> so like a dramaturg on a production of Shakespeare uh, exists primarily to sort of uh, collect research, historical context um, related to the play to kind of help the director and actors understand what it is they're doing um, to to help define words for actors and the director. And um, and on new plays, a dramaturg is almost can be playwright therapist. I was about to say, it is like a therapist. It's someone's like the safe space. They have no agenda except you. Yeah. They're not the director who all, they're all collaborating with you, of course. They're like, oh, you're taking my line. You know, so the actors, the director, the set, they have no agenda, the dramaturg, except you and the yeah. piece as a whole. And I, I have one that I've been working with since maybe 2010, uh, Sarah Lunny, mm -hmm. who used to be the, uh, uh, you should start off as, an assistant literary manager of Actors Theater, um, and that's where we st first started working together. And now she's uh, the the literary manager at Playwrights Horizons. And um, but uh, she's worked with me on many of my plays, uh, mm -hmm. in including uh, Dolls House Part Two. Um, I'm wondering, uh, something's missing. Uh, like a Little Shop of Horrors. What was it like when you were on stage, or what was it? Was it exciting? Was it fun? Was it scary? Was it embarrassing? Was it? A, what's your best memory of acting? It's been funny. I haven't really thought about that in ages. Um, my memory of acting is is uh, is probably something that that as a playwright I would just hate. Uh, it was <laughs> like, and my memory of it is like it's very loud. I don't know what I was doing except that I was talking very loud. And everything was so big and like and you know, slower than you think you have to be, right? Sometimes because oh, when yeah. you're talking, you have to remember that 
I know, it's all the things that, as a playwright, I know, I'm just like, can it be smaller? Can you do less? Can you go faster? Um, I think I would hate me as an actor. <laughs> do you have a video of it? I, their video exists. Mm -hmm. uh, a VHS player does not exist. <laughs> Thank God. Thank God. <laughs> uh, my, my high school drama teacher came to opening night of Doll's House Part 2, and and uh, she said she did transfer everything to DVD, so she has, she's, <laughs> she has evidence. She has evidence. <laughs> oh, that's so cool that you brought her. Uh, her yeah, she, got, yeah. she was able to come to New York for that's the show. Right. That she be here. The um, is it uh, playwrights? Of course, you talk about opening night. You talk about this and that. Um, but uh, one set I work about is Book Filter, which is a set about books, just helping people say, oh. Here are the new books this week. Here are the ones we're most excited to read and that sort of thing, because there's hundreds of thousands of books come out every year, literally. A million if you count self-published. So there's just a wave of books. And playwrights, I wonder, what was it like when you got like that book? Not the not the copy of the play that would be for actors, but like the actual, like, it's a book of a, your play. Is that, a, that must be a cool... It, yeah, it is, it is. It, you're, you're, you feel very proud of it, and kind of like... On my shelf. <laughs> yeah, next to what do we owe each other? Table. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it, you know, it is. It's great. And you know, the fun part is like because they send you with like 20, 30 copies of it, and mm -hmm. so you, 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 know, you can give it to people. You can, <laughs> you can uh, especially people who are in the play, um, and that feels nice. To see. I don't have a good gift uh, facility for reading a script or a screenplay yeah. and knowing how it can or should play or the possibilities. That's not something I've done a lot of, and this is not something I'm very good at. Uh, and so I'll, see, I'll read something, then they'll do it. I'm like, oh my God, look at all the humor. I'm really not good. Yeah. And a number of people talk about your plays as being like on, on page, they are kind of bemused and confused by it. And the actors, but Laurie Metcalf says, wow, it's the wide open possibilities of it. Do you sense when you look at your plays as pieces of a, uh, of uh, writing, how uh, they seem a little different than others, or do you just avoid more um, yeah. descriptive, like do this, or wh what's going on there? Yeah, I mean, I, I do use very few stage directions. I mean, I, I have no problem with them, but I, 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 because I'm trying to preserve the rhythm of the dialogue, stage directions interrupt that. I mean, I've, I've messed around a lot with how my plays work on, it's something I actually think about this a lot, how the, how the format of plays, mm -hmm. and, um... It matters tremendously, like a poem. Yeah, yeah. Where and, do you break the line? Where do you... And, for example, the, the Disney play, I think, is incredibly hard to read on the page because that play is nothing but sentence fragments. That may have been the one I read. <laughs> yeah, no, it's really, really hard because you actually have to, you have to read it really fast to be able to catch it, but mm -hmm. you have to read it a couple of times very fast. <laughs> it, when you hear it out loud, it makes sense, but it, it, the, the way that the dialogue is constructed is I remove words you need to finish the sentence so that when the actors do it and perform it and take out all the air in between lines, you actually think you're hearing them say words that they're not actually hearing, mm -hmm. but that doesn't make the process of reading it any easier. <laughs> um, so that one's especially hard. Uh, in Dawn's House Part 2 actually had this kind of unusual formatting where, because I was so interested in sort of silence and kind of how characters kind of, there's almost these moments where uh, the characters encounter something, okay, reset, let me try again. And I used blank pages in the script and, and the, the pages will just cut off abruptly and just start on a new page and, and, um, and that, but that turning of the page really makes a, uh, it's a, all right. Yeah, you know, really, so, so the reader matters. can feel how it works. Um, I took it out of that formatting because in rehearsal it's just really annoying. <laughs> because, you know, we would have these, you know, the Noren Torvald scene, Sam said, Turn. can we take out those blank pages? Because all I'm hearing is page turning and not silence. <laughs> and I'm like, yes, let's take them out. Um, but I, I am interested in, like, how can you make a play it, uh, read on the page like it does on the stage and Poet Ann Carson actually is a big influence on me in terms of, I think she's really effective at using pagination and word placement, and you know other poets too. Marion Moore is actually a favorite of mine. It's uh, and that brings the issue of ebooks. Is it yeah. available as an ebook? Because that's a nightmare to deal with formatting because of yeah, people can make the print larger and smaller, and it's really. Oh, and I, I I know that that Ann Carson gets super involved. I've heard that she you gets can, really involved in those ebooks. You have to with poetry, especially. It just it falls apart if you don't pay attention. Uh, uh, but it's hard. They read on a phone yeah. or they read on a tablet. It's just it's gonna or a Kindle. It's gonna change. You know, I I, I have not 
gotten so involved in the <laughs> ebook, and now you're like, hey, sorry, yeah, I'm like just, great. I'm like thinking, uh, I need to add that yeah. to my list. And you know, on the audiobook, there's a laugh track. Just like a sitcom. <laughs> Did you know that? Did they not mention that there's a laugh track in the audiobook version? The um, it's a. Uh, it's, uh, you, when you've got the play and you, you've seen these shows progress, it's, it seemed pretty uh, easy. Uh, from looking outside, it's like, oh, you did Humana, the New York yeah. Times highlighted you, you've had plays produced nonstop, uh, you probably have only had to eat, you know, wheat germ for a month at a time, right? Early on, you've been okay, you're not like rolling in the dough, but you've had a steady succession of work. Does it yeah. feel easy or fun? Or are you like, oh, sorry? It does. I, well, I mean, so there was 10 years where I couldn't get anybody to read my play. Fair and that was an okay. interesting. But that was an interesting period. But you're, you're 37 now. Yes. Yes. So, so but your first uh, breakthrough was, or, or you manifest, or when, when, when did you have something? It was 2012. Death tax at Humana. Death tax was the role. Was break. was the sort of my my proper professional debut. And so that's five years ago. So you were about 32. Yeah. So it was 22 to 32. So yeah. you graduated from college and you started being a barista. Or what did I, you do? I so. It, I used to. This is a. This is totally random. But um, I ended up running the day-to-day -day operations and case intake for a not-for-profit legal organization, and then started teaching law students how to represent unemployment insurance cases. Um, case intake. What's this? So, so it was an organization that uh, uh, represented unemployment insurance claimants who had been denied their benefits. Mm -hmm and we're going to an administrative law hearing to get their benefits back. And I would... Um, As a drama major, of course, you were perfect to step in. And well, <laughs> in a weird way, yes, actually, because my, my job was to sort of, was to talk to these claimants and figure out who had a case we could argue. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it didn't necessarily need to be a winning case, but we need to be able to make an argument. And so uh, th those, are the, those are the core elements of drama. You have to figure out, okay, what did you do? Why did you do what you did? Can I make a case for why it was necessary that you did what you did? Or reasonable to think that you would do what you did when you did what you did? <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I mean, that's, that's, uh, that's storytelling. And um, uh, it, 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 uh, you can tell, it, it actually kind of informs my writing to a significant degree. There's a sense in which these monologues the characters deliver. They make their case. They make their case. They feel like hearings. Um, and again, the, the courtroom is another sort of presentational space. That and you've avoided it yet because it's too obvious for you? Or like, or you'll get to the courtroom at some point? So. Uh, it's on my list of things. I, I do actually want to find a way to reinvent the courtroom drama. I want to do a new version of the courtroom drama, but I'm not quite sure what it is yet. Mm -hmm. um, it's the bailiff, I think. Nobody talks about the bailiff. I, well, I, you know, I did, it's funny you should mention that. I, I did dabble in one once that, that will never see the light of day, and, and the bailiff ended up being actually a really important character. <laughs> so it's funny that you said it. But uh, the Ministry of Law hearings look more like, you know, a meeting around a table with a, right. with a judge and, and uh, somebody recording, and um, that's an interesting theatrical space to me, too. But uh, yeah, I mean, it, it was it was great training, listening to people every day tell me stories about difficult things that have happened to them, and, and trying to think through, wait, how do we solve this problem? And um, how long did you do that for? Uh, it was ten years. <laughs> it was ten years, and, and you were writing all the time. Yeah, and, and hello, I, no big. I had a I had this little basement office and windowless basement office, and no one was around because I basically ran the whole place, so I would work all day and write all night down in the You had a free space. office space, yeah, at work. It was, it was actually kind of great, um, but it, it meant that, that I, I developed kind of a, a body of work in that basement, and then, and then once I figured out um, how to get people to read my stuff, which was actually simply a matter of I realized at a certain point I wasn't really sending my plays out that much. <laughs> Somebody asked me, I was complaining, no one knows. Get anything. No one, will, no one will read my plays. And somebody asked me, "How many things do you submit to a year?" And I said, "I submit to lots of things." And then I counted. And it was it's like four, if even that. <laughs> and then I decided, okay, well, I'll, I'll submit to twenty things before the end of the year. And I think I made it to eleven. Mm -hmm. But That's that was enough. That changed it. And, and so I feel fortunate that I mean, those ten years was hard. And but I feel fortunate to have um, 
by the point that people started reading my plays, you know, they sort of asked, oh, this is great, let's put this on. What else do you have? I, I had ready. seven other plays. You weren't like a, a band that had done their first album and all the good songs were there and you had nothing left in there. You're like, oh, now i got to write about being on the road and yeah. the perils of fame. Which has its pros and cons, but it's, it's, a, it's in a different way a scary position to be in. Have we caught up with you yet? I mean, I haven't seen I haven't seen like half of your plays that have been produced. We could have a season at Signature, and it would all be New York debuts for me. Has Death Tax been done in New York? Death Tax hasn't been done right. here. The um, Anna Nicole Smith, uh, Hillary well, and in, Clinton. The Anna Nicole Smith is a ten minute, but oh, Hillary okay. and Clinton hasn't been done here. And uh, uh, the, I have a play about women's boxing mm -hmm. that um, has been done in a smaller workshop production, but uh, that one I'm that one I'm sitting on for the moment. I, 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 I sometimes just sit on the plays and I'll, I'll sort of continue to tweak them until I, I let people read them. All your plays are autobiographical, of course, because you wrote yeah. them. So and all the characters are pieces of you because you give them all their lines. So yeah. even if you don't, you know, you have to identify with them in some way. Uh, but is a, a doll's house um, divorce. You had a, your parents got divorced as a kid, and the play really does grapple with marriage and responsibility and leaving yeah. and coming back together again and making a, a really empathetic case for everyone in, in that situation. Yeah. Did that make it a little more personal for you? Yeah, and and you know it was also a play that I I started writing not too long after a significant breakup. Mm -hmm. So it's it's it is my breakup so you're single, play, yeah. and and it's uh, that song. It's your it's yeah. your Taylor Swift well, play. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I'm 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 no longer single, and I'm, I'm, but uh, uh, and, and, you funny know, how that happens when you get a play on Broadway. Suddenly you're not single anymore. <laughs> well, what was funny about it was that 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 um, I think the play's probably about at least two breakups, and and one where I think I'm Nora, and one where I think I'm Torvald. So, <laughs> uh, what are you doing? I've done everything you asked. <laughs> So it was, uh, so they're, you know, as, as they're fighting, I have made both of their arguments. But you also make the argument of Condola Rashad as uh, the daughter, yeah. uh, who is so beautiful in the play. And I finally learned how to pronounce her name as well. So it's, it's a big day for me, Nathan <laughs> Condola. Uh, but uh, that is the person you were as a kid, the person with the two parents divorcing. I mean, divorce can be traumatic when they get a divorce and it can be traumatic when they don't get a divorce. Hi, mom. So, you know, it, uh, <laughs> it's it's something that I, I loved her perspective as well, very much. Yeah, and I guess it's, there's, you know, the thing the thing that sort of I, I took from myself is, you know, I talk about her as being kind of like the, a, a very typical child of divorce and that she kind of acts as diplomat. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a kind of a, 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 a distance negotiation um, stance that she takes with with Nora, and I, I think, you know, in my experience, very, very typical of, of the child of a divorce. But also, a lot of things she says are uh, things that that I've heard, um, you know, really, really close friends say about their feelings about marriage and and uh, uh, relationships, and so. There's, there's a mix, there's a, a blending of different perspectives that, that wind up in, in the character of Emmy. Mm -hmm. And uh, is, is, are you in a relationship or are you dating? No, you I'm, not in, know I'm, in, a, I'm oh, okay. in a relationship. And uh, 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 she just, she moved in with me about a week before we opened. Well, that's definitely so. a relationship. <laughs> <laughs> if they move in, it's definitely a relationship. Yeah, no, it's, and it's great. It's sort of like, it's it's uh, uh, it, it's very funny to be opening this play as we're in the middle of sort of making a home for ourselves. And amid all the chaos. Amid all the chaos and also amid the conversation that the play creates. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's actually going great. You're like, can we? Well, I should hope so. It's been weeks. Uh, so, <laughs> I mean, as far as when moving in. But uh, you guys are like, let's use Sense and Sensibility as our template, not a doll's house. Let's not try and figure out who's Nora and who's Torval. Let's maybe go to, you know. Uh, no, I mean, I, I think. I'd take Tracy and Heather. I think she's actually kidding me about that. She'll, she'll say. Uh, she'll she'll tell me when I'm starting to sound like one of the characters in the play. And every time you leave, shut the door. The, uh, yeah, I've always thought of Tracy and Hepburn as my ideal uh, relationship. That bantering. Yeah. You, know, you fight, you fight, you fight, and then you make up. Yeah, no, it's it's. Uh, 
Well, it's not so different from George and Martha, too, actually. <laughs> well, I think yes. there, there's, I've heard the argument made. With the lack of love. Yeah. Well, who is it? I, I've been surprised by the number of actors who have done Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf who come away saying, you know, I think it's actually a good marriage. <laughs> and I've, that's always been intriguing to me. And, and, and in fact, it's something that sort of is in the back of my mind while writing this play. And I, I'm very curious what that's a function of. But uh, a number of actors who have played those parts have, have made the case that they really do believe that they very much love each other. Mm -hmm. And that, that, you know, that, that this is how their marriage works. But I don't know if that's like uh, Stockholm Syndrome of, of playing those parts. Um, that brings up the obvious state, and they have a, an issue with a, play, a, a director who didn't have the rights yet to the play, yeah. wanted to do it. They're always very careful with casting, and Albies had diverse casting. A lot of the shows, in fact, in the West End is uh, The Goater, who is Sylvia, which has uh, two black actors and roles originally played by white people. Uh, but they're like, no, in this particular play, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, these characters don't make sense. We want them to be cast as this race because if it was a black man married to a white woman, it would just create different dynamics in the 60s and they would talk about it. So it's interesting playwrights, of course, should have control in their lives. But it is interesting that you've always had diverse casting in your shows. And I'm just wondering about that time consuming or that interesting challenge of seeing your shows done around the country. Yeah. I'm assuming this one is going to be gangbusters because it's four people in a room. Yeah. Uh, so that'll be fun. But you've had like maybe Red Speedo has been harder to do because of the pool. Well, people, people, people are under the impression that you need the pool. You actually don't. There's a way to do it without the pool. But <laughs> which, which you immediately run. Yeah. So for the high school production, you don't need a pool. They can just hold it in the gym. The, 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 the world, the room, the world yeah. premiere actually didn't have a pool. Um, but, uh, 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 yeah, I mean, I... Because right here you've had two plays done at the same time, but you're seeing that with your earlier plays. I'm sure the Christians have been yeah. gotten a good a lot of regional interest because of the subject matter and the presentation. It makes it really uh, easy Yeah, that play. gets done a lot. Actually, Isaac Sai gets done a lot. Um, cool. It, 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 but uh, I have, I've not really seen many no. um, other productions of the plays. I, it's hard for me to watch them if I haven't been involved in the rehearsal process. Because um, you, because you, unpleasant surprises, or it just feels well, distant to you. Just, it's it's the latter. It feels distant to me, and and um, uh, in, but I'm also very particular about just every facet of production, every facet of performance. Um, when somebody licenses the rights to the play, I actually include they they get sent a um, document that's about seven or eight pages long. It's almost written in essay form, but it's about the writing of the play and why it was written the way it was. And but it's also a document that just sort of explains how the play works. Mm -hmm. What what I've discovered is the acting style that best serves the play. And and um, you know, it's not quite me telling people how to do the play, but it's providing useful information. So that's my way of sort of being involved. Which makes it all the more fascinating to have it being done on both coasts at the same time, at Doll's House Part Two, and seeing slightly different acting styles and presentations of it. Yeah, I mean, I think the the, the, the basic rules of performance were the same. You know, there, there's just um, you know, there's there's certain principles of the the sound of the thinking needs to be louder than the sound of the feeling. Meaning, like a lot of times, I like the information about character and where that character is to come through the rhythm as opposed to using um, strongly using vocal intonation to do it um, and uh, so I think that was sort of you know enforced in sort of both productions Condola's um, doing that to a T. <laughs> All I remember is the rhythm. It's so awesome. She's like, okay, I can tell her reacting, that's you, it's not me. And she's got this little, oh, it's awesome. Yeah, and it, it, you know, we played around with the idea that it's sort of expressed in very, that that, that style exists in uh, varying degrees with, with each of the actors. And, um, but, uh, you know, regardless, it's still, even, even when I have like this prescribed style, there's a great deal of variety in how it gets played. And uh, I, I meant to ask somebody before I spoke to you, uh, so I don't want to be flippant, but uh, you said your next play is about your mom, mm -hmm. which to me immediately raised the question, is she still alive? Yes, yes, Oh, okay, because yes, yeah, I was yeah, like, yeah. I yeah. often told my mom, oh, I got a great play, but you have to die first before I can put it on. So, you know, she's yeah. like, what? <laughs> it's, it's a play composed from some interviews with her mm -hmm. about this strange incident that happened. Um, back in the late 90s when I was a freshman in college and she was a hospital chaplain and, and uh, 
incident of this this very frightening incident that happened with uh, oh she was taken a hostage yeah a patient that Good she guy. was working in the psych ward and um, uh, and it played that she wanted me to write like she kept asking me to and I kept saying oh I don't know I don't yeah, know it's too close yeah. and uh, then I came up with a way of doing it um, that I think is I think works so now I'm trying to think of what presentational. <laughs> Thing your gambit you're using on that. Huh? It's it's a uh, yeah it's a secret for the moment, but it's it's a good one. It's mm -hmm. a good one. Um, I had a niece who worked in a, a, a observation at night uh, in a psych ward uh, overnight, which is very interesting and scary. I think yeah. and she's a dental major, and uh, so she saw how the people came in when they were going to do dental work and how they would deal with the patients. You know, you often you have a little kid, they're scared, you have to do yeah. And the techniques used in the mental ward to help people who could be dangerous and help calm them uh, actually apply to the real life of the less extreme, but it's sort of that technique and that way of calming them and using them and getting them secure and safe so you can do dental work on them without them hurting you or themselves is so kind of fascinating to know, to observe that sort of ritual. And so I can imagine like, uh, you know, yeah, your psych ward, a hospital chaplain, a psych ward, that's a, that's a whole cuckoo's nest of uh, possibilities. Yeah, I know, it's funny, I'm just now remembering things. I can't remember what it's supposed to accomplish, but I remember one of the nurses in that ward, this is a distant memory, was saying that if you flick somebody in the wrist right here, that fix, that that has an effect that sort of... You can center them for a yeah. second or bring them back <laughs> to earth or something. I mean, that it may be completely not true, but that's what she Or it's just so true. odd that it yeah, breaks Yeah, that their... actually might be it. That might be the truth. And so your mom's like, all right, now when do I, she's like, do I get an audition or no? Yeah. So that's uh, having your mom involved and you're like, you have to stay away now that I'm doing the play. You have to stay away while I work on this. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, and that's stressful for her too. If there's, um, I'm, I'm not quite ready to show her the draft, but. Um, and are you like, it's not you? It, well, it, yeah, no, it's, it's, it, 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 I know this isn't really, it, it is both her and it's also, a story that, that is um, has a beginning, middle, and end, mm -hmm. um, and it's not it's not merely a story that just sort of recites the incidents that occurred because that's that by itself isn't interesting or that doesn't mean anything. Um, that's just to what happens next. Yeah, yeah, and so uh, and I think I found a structure that that does communicate. I think some really um, important ideas. And so it'll be interesting to see what happens when she reads it. And are the ideas that she disagrees with? Or are they? It's like I would never say that. <laughs> and is the ethical dilemma or the debate, the case that people make for themselves? I am not sane, or what is sane and insane, or what are the? Do you know yet what you're grappling with? Yeah, it, this it's actually a play about trauma and how do you um, move through trauma, or is that something you can even do? And uh, uh, it's about. Also, this idea of, of the empathetic witness, and um, that, that the act of her telling the story is her trying to find an empathetic witness in the audience, and that may be a key to um, getting past this really scary, awful thing that happened to her. So, I think it's about that. I think it's about. Um, there's no, I don't know if I, there's no, I don't know that there's such a thing as getting over trauma. It's not a, that sounds reductive and it sounds kind of like maybe it, dangerous. Because it's right, like you never beat cancer, it's just yeah. something that's there and yeah. you have to keep paying attention to. That, you know, that's exactly it, that's exactly it. And, and um, I, I think, I think the ending is quite, I, I get very moved by the ending of this play. So I'm excited about it, uh, doing a, a workshop of it out at the Goodman. Um, uh, TV and film, Skyrim does a lot of different stuff. Are you, are you, people are obviously talking about adapting things or doing yeah. them. Are you lured at all? Like, what about a 10 part series for HBO? Or are you like, theater, theater, don't? Well, I mean, I, I know I do get approached a lot. I haven't found anything that I feel like I have to do. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what I'm waiting for something where I feel. It can't really be a play strong. or it should be a film or it should be a TV show. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly it. I, I want to I wanna, I wanna have the strong desire to do it. And, it's something that needs to be a, a needs to exist on screen. I think a lot of what I get sent are really talky things, mm -hmm. and I actually think as as my my uh, screen identity is much closer to Hitchcock mm -hmm. or 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 uh, you know uh, 
I love I love the sort of stuff of thrillers. Um, Hitchcock is a film. I mean, I know they keep trying to adapt her window, but it is pure cinema. It cannot be a, a success. You know, it's not yeah. meant to be a play or not to make, yeah. or a book. It is a film in every possible way. Yeah, just in the way in which the the you, you're just watching characters um, come up against physical obstacles and the way in which a camera can kind of ratchet up the tension. That's all really exciting stuff to me. You know, it, every, every film person is always surprised when they ask me about, for example, movies. And they say, well, actually... You think you're going to say Bergman or something? Yeah, no, it's actually, you know, Mad Max Fury Road is maybe was, my favorite thing I've seen in a couple of years. That was wonderful. I mean, when they had the guy strapped yes. to the thing, playing the, doing the score. <laughs> I mean, I was in the first five minutes. I was like, "All right, I'm in. This is yeah, ridiculous." Me too. Totally. I love George Miller. I think Babe is just an absolute it's masterpiece. I love film. Babe, Pig in the City. Yeah. You, I mean, that's just. And then Lorenzo's Oil, and obviously, the, I mean, he's. I he's forgot a, that he did Lorenzo's Oil. I watched that movie range. like five times as a kid. It's I, terrific. Yeah. It's a terrific movie. It's just, it's just an interesting range, and of course, the animated film not as successful, but it's good. And then you know, back to Mad Max. It's just a, an amazing scope of yeah. stuff that he does. What's your favorite Hitchcock film? Um, well, which one have you I'm, watched the most? I'm really, I probably watch North by Northwest the most. Mm -hmm. um, and I, it, it's either North by Northwest or Vertigo. Not, not, not Vertigo, not Vertigo. <laughs> not vertigo. It's, it's too much of it is, uh, yeah, I can't handle Vertigo. Some of it is some of the best ever. <laughs> But like when he's trailing, I don't care that it's surreal and a dream or whatever. But he's following in the car and he's two feet behind her. I cannot enjoy it. It's just too ridiculous. It's an empty LA or wherever they are. And he's like this close. I'm like, for God's I'm sake. Kick out of that. You know, yeah, no, that just drives me nuts. But you know, when she does her transformation and the music comes up yeah. from Wagner, it's just unbelievable. It's so it's so powerful and good. I'm more a more rare window. Yeah. And then uh, the lady vanishes or some of the uh, oh, I do the, like the British lady period is such yeah, great I stuff. Do like, I do like that. What do you do to, to you're, you're in the midst of award season, it's exhausting, you come home, you're like, I can't talk, and you collapse on the, on, the, on the couch. What do you do to relax, or even when you're working on plays? Is it music? Is it book? Can you read books while you're writing, or? I read a lot of nonfiction. Yeah. Um, I, uh, I actually... Such as uh, Sartre, or something talking about uh, or psych wards, what or... Am I, what am I reading right now? I'm reading um, uh, this book called The Death of Expertise. Um, it just came out sort of Because we're all amateurs, everybody thinks they're an expert. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I, 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 and, uh, actually, I'm really interested in video games. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I do play video games. I just got a, one of the virtual reality headsets. So I'm trying to figure out how does that form work. Well, that's very interesting. I have friends at Khan who uh, they've just seen uh, Inaritu, who's a director I don't really care for that yeah. much. He sort of seemed like a one trick pony, but he's done a six minute virtual reality piece at Khan. It's in a giant warehouse outside of town and it has a sand floor, and you go in alone and you put on the goggles, and so you have the tactile experience of the floor, and boom, you're in the desert. You're absolutely in the desert between uh, Mexico and uh, the US, mm -hmm. California, whatever, Texas. And in the way you're like, Wow, I'm in the desert, you know. Like, you, yeah. and then you see off in the distance people coming in. There, people being smuggled or, or escaping into America, and they're there. And then a helicopter comes. And my friends say, "You just, you can't. You have to duck. You cannot handle it. You know, you, and you just feel so much part." And then a truck comes up with soldiers and border guards. And they have guns and they're pointing and screaming at you. And you're, you're trying to get out of the way. You're trying to hide. Like you can't stop yourself from not. And you're just immersed in that experience. And it's. It's not uh, like a movie done in VR. It's a different thing. It's yeah. an experience. And uh, this may be sort of the first step towards creating something that's not just, oh, cool, I'm on a mountain, yeah. but an actual emotional experience. Uh, as opposed to telling a story, it creates a moment and a thing that you just can't have in any other way. And they, they, if they say it feels like, well, the Hollywood Reporter said, it's like those early movies where they point the gun and the audience would scream and run out of the way. Yeah. Like, oh, ha, ha, how silly they are. Primitive fools in the 1800s. It's like, well, no, here you are ducking and cowering because it feels so real and it really feels like it might be the beginnings of uh, something kind of creative in a really interesting way. Yeah, I, I no, I was thinking about the, the exactly that, the, the, the anecdote about the, the train coming at the screen. Right. Screen and, uh, People audience, fleeing. fleeing. And uh, I've had a couple of moments sort of like that in, in virtual reality and it's, it's interesting and I also kind of wonder if dialogue works especially well in VR. Where um, you know, there's always a challenge with dialogue on screen. There's a there's a 
you have a limited level of interest in it. You know, Tell Woody Allen. And, and well, and, and 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 I think how dialogue works on the screen ends up working. It, it's very different than how it works on the stage. And I've actually found myself kind of wondering if um, dialogue in VR actually might work a little more like it does on stage than on screen. Um, because one of the challenges with VR is also knowing where to look. Because you can't use the, the typical cinematic grammar of, of um, uh, you have to think You have to think like sleep no more. Yeah. You have to think of immersive. You have to think of, which is why, I don't know why they would build a new Broadway house with standard seating. It should just be a flexible space. Yeah. You know, it, it's, it, it, that would be fascinating, actually, if somebody did that. Um, but, um, yeah, no, I think the sleep no more is a, is a, is a good comparison, too. And, and, but I, I have found, I like watching um, um, documentaries and stuff on, in virtual reality, 360 documentaries. And, and uh, I find myself being much more interested in the presence of a person just standing in front of me, talking to me, than I would if I were just watching it on a flat screen. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's just, it's fascinating in a different way. That feels more theatrical than it does cinematic. Hmm. Um, I've seen other people talk about how maybe VR is like just being in a wood, and not not like you have to go explore it, but like you're just there and you're present and you're listening and you, and how somehow that makes you pay more attention than if you were actually in the woods. Yeah, no, that's that. Yeah, that, and uh, uh, I think that's true as well. Everything sort of becomes heightened in a way. Uh, the the ordinary. Um, the ordinary becomes extraordinary in VR. Mm -hmm. Well, Roger Ebert said, uh, "Call me when you have a video game that's a work of art." I know. And he plays it. He tries it. He's like, <laughs> and I'm like, I don't know. I'm getting close. I think. Well, what's the closest to a work of art? Or when you hit a million on a, you know, for me, around asteroids. I mean, that's how old I am. You know. the, the, uh, there's a there's a game called Portal, and it has a sequel, Portal Two, that I think actually shocking, has shocking title. <laughs> really, it has extraordinary writing. Mm -hmm. um, it's beautifully written. It's a it's um, um, it's a it's a puzzle game, but it has this narrative that kind of sneaks up on you, and is uh, the characters are completely original characters and, and it, it's not a game that ever stops to tell its story. The, the movement through the game unveils the story. Mm -hmm. And so I think that, that one is actually probably about as close as I've seen. It I, builds on mist and sort of sense of like there's a more of a story than just a world to explore. Exactly, yes. It has all of the things that made mist interesting plus a, an, an urgent story um, that has danger and has stakes and and you come to realizations about who you are in the course of it. Um, that that I think is is is, is a, in fact a masterpiece. There's there's a university somewhere that for their freshman reading list includes that video game. Oh, that's cool. Um, and it's it's yeah it's on that level I think. And then there's the music. What's uh, what, what music are you listening to right now? What music? Um, you know I find. Uh, Do you need silence when you write? No, I do need music. Uh, I feel like myself and a lot of other writers have been writing to Max Richter music. Um, <laughs> and you can, you can tell now that he's like infiltrated all of TV, but I've been writing to him for years. And he still keeps coming out with stuff that it's, it's repetitive in a way that I find really helpful as I write. As opposed to Philip Glass? or Well, Philip Glass, I do. I like writing to Philip Glass very much. Um, uh, Survey. Oh, a good bit of PJ Harvey. Mm -hmm. um, she had a new single that just came out that I, I find myself listening to on repeat. Um, I'm still stuck in To Bring You My Love, but she just had a really good album recently. Yeah, she did. I, 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 I can't remember names of albums at all. But well, that's because it's digital now. It used to be you would hold it's it true. and I used no, to see the or the and you would stare at it. Right. See, and now you're walking it. I never see the name. I can barely remember anything. It's a, it's a nightmare. I'm still listening to Leonard Cohen's last album. That's really good. That's, uh, I mean, he's... Good. Well, no, he had a little down period, isn't it? But he really had a great flourish, and not quite at the Johnny Cash level, but it really was a, a great swan song. Three albums in a row that were really yeah, strong. Yeah, the, the, last, the last three I thought were really great. And I, oh, I was the other night I was doing my writing, listening to um, Live in Dublin, uh, Leonard Cohen Live in Dublin. I never saw him in concert, which is ridiculous. Uh, what was the last concert you went to? 
you know, I don't go to concerts. Mm -hmm. um, I, it's I, an immersive experience, you know. It is, but I get really nervous. I, I, I don't like the crowds, and, and I don't like the feeling that stuff is like at my back. Mm -hmm. um, so I get really anxious in concert venues. I, I can't Even if it's a do sit it. down, like a Beacon Theater or, or a it, jazz club or something. Yeah, but the other thing is, I. And I, I, there's probably room for me to actually really immerse myself into concert going and just discover that as a theatrical form. But um, I, always have, yeah, have I, I, I always have the, the, the feeling that I can't hear it as well as I can hear it on my headphones. Like it doesn't sound as good as But dear it's God, it's a performance. It's I not, know, it's not, I know. I know. <laughs> how dare you? Yeah, I know. It's, it's all about in, in the moment. I know. Yeah, my, I, I actually just, uh, the other the other thing, I started listening to LCD Sound System, who I've actually never really listened to I've before. I've never paid attention to him. And my agent was telling me, you have to go see him in concert. I was like, okay. So they'll, they'll hook me up when he's next in town performing. So after the psych ward, we'll have a, a rock concert or a courtroom trial, perhaps. Yeah. They're all percolated in the background. Well, and, you know, I, I do have something that I've been working on for a little while. I do have a musical um, that Cesar Alvarez and I have been very slowly working on it, that will be in the form of a concert. So, mm -hmm. and I've been watching a lot of concert videos. Um, concert videos, as opposed to concert films, like so obviously stop making sense. Oh no, sorry, that's 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 well. I actually no, I think they in fact they are concert videos because they're not very professionally taken, you know, not very professionally filmed, which is also something that I kind of like. About <laughs> them. So, but stop making sense was was a huge influence on me. I had this moment where I realized. I had seen it again for the first time in like maybe 2002, 2003, and I suddenly remembered, oh, my mother used to show this to me. And it made me wonder, oh, that is that why I like the Worcester Group and Richard <laughs> Foreman? Because then I was like, this reminds me of Richard Foreman and Worcester Group. And of course it does, because it's in that, I mean, in fact, you know, like Joanna Glitus was the consulting director on it, yeah. Beverly Emmons, who did Einstein on the Beach, did the lights for it. Uh, the the big suit, in fact, was influenced by the Worcester Group, right? And it's it's um, so it's funny how that all comes together. But that's a that's one that I go back and rewatch every so often. That's a seminal film for me. It was the first movie I got to see as a college student critic, and they said, oh, wow. oh you, you can go. You know, I get to see it. And usually, we did movies didn't come to Gainesville in advance. They just showed up, and so we didn't get. We had to go see them on Friday and then review them on Saturday or Monday. Yeah. This one, they had a print like a week earlier or something, and so we got to go along with the local critic. The local critic didn't show up, so I'm in a single screen theater, and I didn't know I could bring a guest, though of course I could have. But like, it's empty. It's an entire, like a like the Ziegfeld, a thousand seat arena, empty. I know virtually nothing about Talking Heads. I had not bought an album yet. I listened to tons of music, but I just hadn't done them yet. So I knew burning down the house, but that was it. And I'm there at the concert alone in this space, and this movie comes up, and it was like, oh my god! You know, you run out, and you buy the albums, like three albums right away, because it was so unbelievably good. Yeah, it, it was just theatrically the structure of it, just the sort of oh, idea of bare stage, and oh. then we're going to slowly build the concert, and then it, then it's until your head just explodes. Blow up. Until and, your head explodes. And uh, I, I think about that a lot when I'm building plays. I think I learned a lot about play structure. From what was that first play that you saw, professional production, presumably, but maybe it wasn't, maybe it was even a high school thing that you saw and that you said, wow. I think it might have been a production of Christmas Carol. Mm -hmm. and, and, um, uh, and what appealed to me so much about it was the, uh, uh, well, it's got kind of like an anti-hero in it. I think I maybe I... Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I, 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 I you think like that them. might have been exciting to me to sort of see a play about a grumpy person. And um, he's much more than a grumpy person, but uh, and the the it's a play with lots of magic tricks. Um, there's a lot of special effects, and uh, there's a lot of dry ice, and you know yeah. I think that, that that stuff was exciting to me, and it, it probably reminded me of, of theme park rides and and magic shows, and, and so I think that was maybe the one that hooked me. And it stuck. Yeah. Well, thanks for taking the time to oh, talk with you. me. This was, this was rejuvenating. Oh, <laughs> I really enjoyed the conversation. Well, I hope so. <laughs> it's sort of like, oh, do I have the energy for it? And this was really nice. Well, cool. I appreciate it. Thank you.